Hi, this is Steve Warona, and you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Before I introduce today's speaker, here's a brief orientation to the Adobe Connect interface we're using. Your browser right now is showing the title slide for today's talk. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a box labeled questions and comments where you can read and type messages. There's a tab labeled everyone at the bottom of this box, and that's the tab you'll use for all of your general messages, including questions and comments for our speaker. We'll be breaking for questions several times during the presentation, so please do not hold your questions to the end. You can also send direct messages to a specific person by hovering your cursor over a name in the attendee list. And one of those names is technical help, and that's the place to go if you run into technical problems. We're also monitoring Twitter for your questions and comments. Use hashtag NCCPSWebinar. Now, if you missed part of today's conversation, or if you want to see some or all of it again, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be available shortly after the webinar on the NCCPS Webinars webpage. And watch your email for a link to a brief evaluation survey requesting your reactions and comments on today's presentation. Please take a minute to respond to that survey when the link arrives. We do appreciate your feedback. It is important that you respond. And now for today's presentation. A month ago, on Monday, August 24th, the Internet observed a major milestone. On that day, 1 billion people connected to Facebook. That's one in every seven people on the planet. A billion people on Facebook, 300 million on Twitter, another 300 million on Instagram, 350 million on LinkedIn. With numbers like these, it's no surprise that social media have profoundly impacted communication patterns across all of society. And nowhere has the impact been greater than on college campuses, creating unique challenges for those charged with safety and security, including police, campus public safety, counseling services, residential life, threat assessment teams, student affairs, and others. Now, to discuss these challenges, and in particular the role of social media threat alerts, we have with us today Dr. Gary J. Margolis. Dr. Margolis has more than 20 years of distinguished experience in law enforcement and public safety, and over a decade decade in higher education safety and security. He's been a featured presenter for a variety of national organizations, and his work has appeared in such journals as the American Council of Education, Police Chief Magazine, the Campus Law Enforcement Journal, and Campus Safety Magazine. He's appeared in the New York Times and NPR, among other national media outlets. Gary holds a master's degree in education and a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies from the University of Vermont. He's co-founder of Margolis Healy, which is the National Center's parent organization, and he's president and CEO of Social Sentinel Incorporated. Gary Margolis, welcome to Campus Public Safety Online. Steve, thanks for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today to take part in what I think is a very timely and important conversation. But before I, I move into the presentation, let me just say um, something about the National Center. So many years ago, the National Center was a vision of a number of national thought leaders on the important topic of campus safety and security at a time when uh, campus safety and security was, was going through much change. Things were happening on college campuses, colleges were growing, and the challenges about how we secure our nation's universities and colleges um, were never more prominent. And the National Center was born out of those conversations. And having watched the center move from conception into reality, I just want to point, uh, point out how, how proud I am of our staff at the National Center. And I encourage all of you participating today, of course, you're here because you are participating in a National Center event. But I want to encourage you to share the word, spread the word on the National Center, and allow us to be the resource uh, to you that Congress and the Department of Justice intended. So that's my, my plug of pride and, and my, my pitch for the National Center and all the good work it's doing. So um, as Steve mentioned, I, um, I came uh, uh, with a background in, in university and college uh, public safety and security. And, um, when, um, and, and a couple things related to that, I'll share that kind of set the stage, uh, around social media threat alert services. But I want to start with this particular um, quote. I recognize it comes from uh, a K-12 school, and the National Center, while predominantly supporting universities and colleges, has influence in some resources um, that uh, K-12 schools are using. But more importantly, K-12 school districts producing the, the young adults that move into our colleges. Um, a very important quote 
quote from a good friend of mine, uh, Clayton Wilcox, uh, superintendent of a large district in, in Maryland. And he talked about the way that our students are using their voices and how those voices are shaping the conversations and the medium in which they do that. And um, it's important to me because it frames a conversation that started uh, many years ago now. And I, I, I go back to a time in my career when I was the chief of police at the University of Vermont. And I had come into a day shift uh, roll call briefing. And one of my, uh, my supervisors at the time, um, he was giving a briefing on what to expect during the day. And he was sharing a lot of um, interesting and important information. And I remember saying to him, Afterwards, you know, uh, Jimmy, how do we know these things? Where did we learn this from? This is really good information for the protection of the campus. And he said, well, you know, Chief, you're going to have to go see the midnight shift dispatcher. So I stayed up all day into the wee hours of the evening when police chiefs become bats because we're not used to being up that late. And I met with our midnight shift team, and I had a conversation that planted a seed that, not, uh, that germinated into, into, in part, this very conversation we're having today. And that, um, that conversation was, there's a lot happening on this, these things called um, you know, blogs, these, these RSS feeds, these web pages. And this particular dispatch was, dispatcher was a telecommunications officer, was very good at going and looking at this stuff. It was all public. I mean, it wasn't hidden. And she would cull through it and gather information on all kinds of things. We, we had students who were bragging about um, having committed sexual violence. We had um, large gatherings being coordinated, which were certainly not illegal, um, but yet required some kind of social safe, uh, uh, public safety strategy to make sure that the, the event was, was, was not impeded or everyone was safe. And so this is at a time when, when this thing called Facebook was brand new, and you had to have a .edu email address to join it. And I realized at that moment that things were changing. No longer were the bulletin boards in our university and college student centers the place where our students were posting things for rides home or, you know, who's got a TV for sale or I've got to get rid of my, my, uh, my mini refrigerator. Um, things were now shifting into a different format of communication. And then I moved forward in that um, to the years kind of roll from that point on. And I have teenagers. I have um, um, uh, early teenagers in their, in their teenage lives who live on their social media accounts and listening to them and how they interact with their friends, it all began to shape a thought about the digital conversation that uh, grew into the concept or the need or the understanding of social media threat alerting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that definition um, in a moment. So what is this digital conversation, and how do we become a part of that conversation in a meaningful way? How do those of us who are in student affairs, in public safety, um, in counseling, in residential life, how do we engage in that conversation in a way that respects privacy, that recognizes what is happening in the public space, and allows us to do the best we can to protect our students or to offer the support they need when they're reaching out to either harm themselves, harm others, um, engage in behavior which is, 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 is dangerous. And so this is really about social media threat alerts. I use the term threat alerts because I, I'm very careful to respect privacy. It's very important to me as a member of, our, of, our, of, of the United States, as someone who, who took an oath to the Constitution at one point in my life, um, to continue to recognize the, the importance of privacy in our lives, and especially in a world that's so digitally connected. And so we talk about threat alerts because it's different than monitoring. And that's important in the conversation we're going to have today and in the, in the information we share, that this is really about how do we who are charged with campus public safety, how do we engage in the social media conversation in a way that respects privacy, that doesn't monitor, but that recognizes um, what these alerts can be and what they look like. And so that's part of what today's conversation is going to be. I'll share with you some of the examples, like what are the most common social media sources, social media networks that are prevalent, what are growing, who's using what, what are our college students using, what are our high school students using, um, and then actually share with you some of the kinds of things that we're seeing through social media threat alerting and why it's now critical to being a part of the campus safety strategy. Much in the same way, and I'll take some of you back a little bit in time, where you know, I, I came into to, to law enforcement and campus law enforcement at a time when security cameras were, were being introduced. And the discussion they sparked on privacy 
and security. I, I was part of the, the conversations around security technology when we began to move, for those of you who remember this quite well, from keys to access control, where access control became much more than a key, a, a physical hard key. Now our, our key shops were becoming part of the IT infrastructure of the institutions, right? And then most recently, the conversations we've had around mass notification. And for those of us who remember that prior to the tragedies at Virginia Tech, um, that uh, you know, sending mass notification messages was not standard at universities and colleges and created all kinds of challenges, and then recognizing that it became part of something every university um, and college then had. So this technology, this idea of social media threat alerting, is another part of the ongoing use of technology for the safety and the security of our campuses, given all that's being shared in that venue. So this is about threat intelligence. It's about gathering the right information to talk about the right things. It's not about the, the, the volume of data. You know, 12 years, 15 years ago, when I had that conversation with um, my, the dispatcher, the telecommunications officer, that was at a point where you, one person could sit in front of a computer screen for, for a couple hours a night and actually scan all that information. You could do it manually. You can't do that anymore. And in a day and age when every, people are, are sharing through, through social media everything from the, the cup of coffee they had in the morning um, to you know, the dinner they have at night to almost every random thought they could have, it's no longer are we able to look at all of that volume of information. So many universities and colleges, and I'll share the data further in a little bit, um, are looking at ways in which they can gather threat intelligence in a meaningful way, in a way that doesn't um, generate more work for them, but helps with the existing, um, uh, with the workload within their existing systems. It's another piece of data that flows into their network of support. And so that's important, that it's not about monitoring, it's really about threat um, intelligence. So I'll share a couple of examples from both the higher ed and the K-12 space. Um, if I spent um, uh, every day uh, incorporating news alerts on social media related issues happening in schools, um, we'd spend the entire presentation showing you news stories. Um, it's that prevalent. In, in, in middle schools and in high schools, it's a lot about bullying. It's a lot about um, um, uh, targeted violence in terms of what's being shared. Um, it's a lot about suicide and depression and, and cutting and self-harm. Uh, we're seeing in the, the higher ed space, um, it's about suicide and depression. Um, it's about um, certain illegal activities. Um, it's about spontaneous large gatherings. Uh, this is a story that ran in the New York Times on April 20th of this year. Um, and this particular uh, story, the picture is Panama City Beach, Florida, and the record numbers of, of students there for spring break. The story is about the Keene Pumpkin Festival in Keene, New Hampshire, and how the pumpkin festival exploded in growth at, a at, the, at, at this year's event um, because of social media, because of the word being put out. And as, um, as I've traveled college campuses across the country over the last six, seven years, helping schools um, address a myriad of safety and security issues, we've consistently seen an increase of the role of social media in the events that we are helping with um, on the Mark Willis Healy side. So um, it was the impetus for the creation of Social Sentinel and of the, um, the importance of this concept of threat alerts and social media threat alert services. And so recognizing that in the higher ed space, it's gatherings, it's organization, it's um, self-harm, it's some criminal activity, all happening in the digital world being held in the palm of the hand and not on the bulletin boards around campus as it did many years ago. Gary, thanks a lot for that, uh, for that introduction. You're listening to Campus Public Safety Online. Our guest today is Gary Margolis. We're talking about the implications of social media on campus safety and security, the role of social media threat alerts. Um, if you have a question or comment for Gary, uh, type that into the line at the bottom of that pod on the left side of your screen that says questions and comments. We've got several Q&A breaks planned, and we do want to get as many questions as possible. Um, Gary, uh, how does what you're going to be talking about today change between small schools and large schools, public and private, um, uh, are, are there differences among these various kinds of institutions? 
Steve, that's a great question. Um, what we're seeing in the use and prevalence of social media is consistency in the fact that we have students and those students are using social media. So um, uh, whether you're a small school, a private, a public, a large school, uh, your students and presumably your faculty and staff, I mean it's not just your students, your community is, is living in their network on social media, is communicating on social media, is sharing on social media, and they're sharing all kinds of things. Um, things that um, uh, you, you know may be as innocuous as, as you know when uh, when a meeting of a social club is happening or student uh, group is happening, um, right down to um, people reaching out for help, um, you know because they are in the throes of of a depression or in need of help, and and using social media as the tool for which they're reaching out. So we're not seeing so much a difference based on size and and demographic as much as we are the reality that students are using this um, wherever they are. Let me, let me squeeze one more question in during this break and let me remind you all out there, please type in your questions and comments. We will get to them. Um, the picture that you were showing a minute ago from, from the New York Times, you know, even though we have wonderful facial recognition software nowadays, those people in that, in that photo were pretty much anonymous and that sort of makes me wonder um, to what extent the rising use of, of anonymous social media technologies um, is impacting the work that you're trying to do? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. I think the, um, the chapter in the book has yet to be written on anonymous social media services, other than the fact that amongst younger teenagers, they're on the rise. Um, uh, the use of things like uh, Snapchat and, and, and Whisper and other anonymous sources um, uh, that create quite a bit of consternation for, for university and college and K-12 school administrators given um, some of the vitriol and some of the meanness that can be spewed through them. Um, and so um, it, you know, it's an interesting discussion amongst those of us who are involved in the social media world in, in, in looking at use and, and, and tracking it as to where those services end up down the road because they create such incredible um, backlash at the same time um, that their popularity among certain ages continues to surge. Um, so it's certainly, it's certainly a challenge. And it's a challenge in the safety angle because information is being shared and it's not uh, easily identifiable, right, uh, necessarily. So you get the information, but you can't do much with it, right? The bomb threat that comes in over uh, an anonymous social media service um, may leave the, uh, the, the, the public safety uh, department at the university or college uh, a little bit stymied, you know, as a result of some of those challenges. Thanks, Gary. Um, I'll let you get back to your presentation. And, and someone who's already peeked at your next slide um, is already wondering what the uh, icon, what, what the lower right icon is, the smiley face with the dealy bopper on, on, on top. So, so, so why don't you tell them that? Absolutely. I was going to go through that. That's a great question. I, I, I was, I was going to have a little contest as to who could name the most <laughs> of these, but I figured that there was no great forum to be able to do that on this uh, particular uh, webinar. So these are the most popular social media services that exist, and there are, there are some others, um, but these are the main, um, the main popular services. Um, of course, in the upper left-hand uh, corner is Twitter, followed by LinkedIn and Google+, and Facebook, Flickr, uh, and Tumblr, the last on the right on the top, and then Pinterest, um, which is gaining as the most popular social media um, network for women, uh, Pinterest is. Instagram is uh, next, and Instagram is the most um, popular uh, social media service for um, adults or young adults from uh, children 12 to young adults 24. So. Instagram is, is, is growing quite a bit in its grasp of that teenage young adult population, followed by Vimeo and YouTube, um, Meetup, and then um, the last is Reddit. Um, and that's the little Martian guy with the thing on his head, the doo-wop around his head, right? So um, these are the most popular. Now there are others. There are other social media source, uh, services that are growing, that are developing um, from Periscope. I mean, what we've seen in the world of social media networking and social media services is the growth of image focused networks. So the, 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 the Instagrams and, um, and uh, in part um, the Twitters, um, those that you can, you can show images as opposed to the decline, at least amongst the demographic that are in college, high school and college, is Facebook. It's dropping year over year. 
um, in, in the 12 to 24 year old um, range. So most of your college students, if you're a university, are um, connected through Instagram um, and, and, and Twitter um, as such. Um, Tumblr is popular and growing in popularity between 12 and 24 year olds as well. Um, and, um, and those like Periscope, which is a new service, and, and, um, and a couple others that are like Periscope offer live video streaming. Uh, so you have, you're at an event, you, you, you stream it live for a period of seconds you know, over the social media network. So that's the next kind of, we went from the text-based to the image-based, moving into the video-based. And, and these, are, these are changing fast. Um, if some of you watching this presentation or participating don't recognize some of these services, that's okay. Don't be surprised. Um, some of them are popping up new um, and disappearing and shifting. It's that quick. It really is happening that fast. Um, so let me go on to the next. In terms of age distribution, this was as of December of last year. Uh, a recent um, study I found found just today when I was doing some updated research, shift this around a little, little bit, whereas Snapchat at this point was in the 45% range for 18 to 24-year-olds, Instagram has now crept north of that in terms of growth and expansion. Um, and Twitter is shrinking a little bit amongst our demographic of 18 uh, uh, to 24-year-olds and 12 to 24-year-olds. And Facebook is falling farther. It's now at 14% for that age demographic. 70% of Americans, according to the Pew Research Center in 2014, 70% of Americans who are online use social networking. 70% who are online use social networking. And it's the old and it's the young. Um, uh, you know, my, my wife's uh, 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 grandfather, uh, may rest in peace, had a, um, uh, an Internet account in his 90s and was active on the Internet, email, and social media. Um, right down to, at the time, my you know, 10 and 11-year-old who were living in the way they communicated. We're seeing that spread, right? And it's certainly um, more prevalent with people under 50, but it's growing amongst the older demographics. It really is growing amongst the older demographics. Um, and, of course, we're seeing the older demographics gravitating more towards the text-based social media, the, 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 the written-based social media services like the Facebooks and others like that, um, and, as, and, and the YouTubes, and those where you're sharing videos and family, um, as opposed to, again, as I mentioned, the younger population looking at the image-based um, of Instagrams and, and Twitters and, and Pinterest um, and Tumblr. So that's where those are falling. 32% again iterated before, um, Twitter and Instagram growing in popularity there, um, and Facebook declining a little bit according to the most recent Piper Jaffrey study uh, that came out on what are teens using, and of course teens being inclusive of college students and then of course them becoming young adults in their early 20s and the trending continuing in that direction. So we talked a little bit about this, um, a little bit about the why is this so important, and what are we seeing, um, uh, uh, the use of social media, both on campus and off campus. Things happening in the community spark conversation that are being shared instantly, videos being shared instantly. A recent shooting at a university in the last week and a half um, at uh, uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, right off campus, um, sparked a lot of of postings, a lot of sharing of what was going on in almost real time, like you, you stitch them together and kind of see what was going on in real time, right? Gang activity, negative sentiment, and how that information is inciting. We're seeing that, again, examples through the United States at universities and colleges. Shootings across the street, these are all real examples. Um, we followed, you know, what was happening in Baltimore, what was happening in, in, in Missouri looking at the trending of social media and what people were posting around safety and security related concerns was extremely informative um, and very important for us to know about those charged with the safety and security of our campuses, right? This is about an open venue to share chronic mental health issues that has also come up. In conversations with those who provide mental health and counseling services to universities and colleges, um, it, it, it didn't surprise them that social media was becoming 
a venue for sharing of that information. And in fact, um, they were teaching me many things over the last year to year and a half about the things that they're seeing, the things they're hearing, what people are posting on social media. And what we believe is beginning to happen, and again, I'll go back to the same trending with video cameras, with, um, uh, with access control, with mass notification, with behavioral threat assessment processes, these things became a duty of care. As the technology allowed cameras, for example, to be more affordable, to be easier to access, to be easier to use, you see them everywhere now. And in fact, a lot of the litigation defense that I do for universities and colleges um, that talk about safety and security, it's often a question of, well, X, Y, and Z happened, you know, they should have had more of a particular technology or more of a particular process related to that technology. So what we're believing to see happen is this evolution of a duty to care that at some point, and there was a recent lawsuit filed in a, a university on the East Coast um, reference uh, Title IX related issues around social media where the, um, the plaintiff asserted that the university should reasonably have known, okay, with, should, would, should reasonably have known the climate on campus that the plaintiff asserted was in existence because of what is being shared on social media. And then it raised questions for those of us who, again, are in campus safety and security about the impact of social media threat alerts on Title IX related concerns, the protection of the complainant, the, you know, the protection of the process, maybe the protection of the respondent um, in those processes, but understanding what is being said. So there's a very interesting time in the history of the evolution of this technology around this duty of care question because so much of what's happening is online in uh, social media networks on our in our communities that the question being asked shouldn't we be paying attention to that in a way that respects privacy and is easy to do so we begin to look at how universities are using social media threat alerts. How are they doing this? You know, what's the process that they're, they're going through? Um, and we're finding a, very, a lot of interesting variations. Some universities are using it to identify and evaluate the severity of the threat, whether it's against an institution, a person. Um, they're looking at it to understand what that looks like. If they have someone coming to campus, a speaker, um, if, if, if there's something controversial happening that's raising the concern of safety. Right? Others gathering information around criminal investigations, protecting victims and witnesses when that's relevant. Um, we're also seeing that play itself out. And this, this is only a short list. The list could be twice as long. I'm just sharing some of the highlights of how um, it's being used to gather information um, around intervention in self-harm and suicide. There have been many examples where social media threat alert services um, have allowed an institution to intervene and save a life when somebody was reaching out in those in those last minutes and hours as to what they um, their safety and security their their self harm um, the monitoring of crowd sentiment the tracking of threats against executives and leadership at the institution the corroborating of witness accounts the incident evaluations um, uh, the you know the monitoring of the announcement of a of a of a presidential candidate or you know the the use of the system to pay attention to the Rolling Stones concert on campus. So there's a lot of examples where the system is being used or the service is being used um, to understand all that is being shared on social media. Here are some examples of th things that have been found on social media. This is an example of a weapon being posted on an airline uh, up to the um, up to the uh, the the, uh, the internet up to the social media network. Um, this is an example of uh, a, uh, and these are real. These, 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 these are one of dozens of examples we could share. Apparently, in, in this part of the country, proms are done a little differently than, than in other parts of the country. Um, this is a, uh, an example of a gang dispute at a university where um, threats were being made and a post was made um, and, um, and threat alerts were triggered around both um, race, racist comments, if you read the post, if you can see it, the N-word was used, and also weapons uh, because of the word um, Glock being used. The use of, uh, of the system to, to show drugs, um, to sell prescription drugs, again, social media becoming a big part of this on college 
campuses and in university and in K-12 schools. Um, again, more drugs. So plenty of examples exist. Um, this one is not college uh, necessarily related, but it's very timely because, again, it shows you the things people are saying online. This is the Patriots uh, and the Steelers uh, last week, um, and this is a, a, an assassination threat um, against um, uh, the quarterback. So, um, again, the things that people are saying online, that they're sharing online, on public social media services. The National Center and Margolis Healy ran a survey in 20, the 2015 Campus Safety Survey and asked a question about social media. And what we found is that two-thirds of universities and colleges that responded to the survey indicate that social media was important for safety and security in some way. And two-thirds of those said that they look at this information manually. So they know universities and colleges are recognizing the need to pay attention to social media for safety, not just for reputation, not just for um, uh, understanding how many people like hot dogs at the, at the ball game, but for the safety and security aspects of the institution, given that's what's being shared there. So we're recognizing as an industry, as, as higher education, uh, as K-12, the importance of this information. Thanks, Gary. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Let's see how many we can get to in our next break. Um, someone asks, I have a question regarding Pinterest. Can you provide any examples of actionable intelligence generate, garnered from that site? Uh, I have no examples that I can, I can pull out of my memory right now on actionable events coming out of Pinterest. Um, and the user demographic for Pinterest um, is different. What I'm interested in is, is it's skewing much more towards, um, towards women. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in understanding as we move forward, specifically around Pinterest, given its growth, and given how Pinterest works and what you can, is, um, is there a, that darker side to what's being shared on Pinterest? Um, and I'm interested to understand that better, and I'm going to be paying more attention to that in the coming months. Um, someone says, um, what do you suggest university police departments do to combat the increase of social networks on the dark web, where networking sites are not as easily monitored through third-party software? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, my, my, my rec you know, I guess my recommendation is I've thought about the dark web. Most of our students, most of our faculty, staff, and visitors coming to our institutions um, are not necessarily on the dark web in their postings. They're posting, you know, to be social media services and sites. I think the question of the dark web is is much more um, focused and geared on criminal interdiction and services and tools that allow you to dig deep um, for particular investigative purposes and needs. Um, and that's a little bit different than social media threat alerting. Not not any less important. Just a little bit different than the conversation today in the focus. Um, let me let me squeeze this one in. Uh, th this could this the, the answer to this I think could produce another whole webinar. But let me let me lay it out and see if you want to focus on some area. One of the challenges of social media is its inherent anonymity and or ability to create false identities. How do you reconcile this? That anyone with a computer anywhere in the world can make a threat credible or not. Is it incumbent on us to act on everything? Great question. It's not incumbent necessarily to act on everything. I think it is incumbent to take reasonable steps to assess reasonable information. And this is no different than any other source of information coming into a university, whether it be through a threat assessment team, through the police department, through residential life, through counseling. When information comes forward that makes someone step back and say, gee, that seems like it could be a problem, we're really good. We, I think I think we really are good at doing those kinds of threat assessments. You know, I can get a group of people together representing the demographics I just talked about, and we can behavioral threat assessment teams do this. This is what they do, and put a number of issues on the table in front of them, and allow them to look and, and bring different perspectives to it. I think the data generated through social media gets treated in much the same way any other source of information does for triage, and it doesn't mean you act on everything. You'll know when you read something, you know, there are things we know about when someone makes a bomb threat. You know, you know, when do we need to be concerned about a bomb threat, and when do we recognize the level of concern may not be as high as it would otherwise? There's criteria. You apply similar criteria on your institutions and your campuses to assess the social media alerts coming in. 
Thanks, Gary. Um, let's move ahead with your presentation. All of you out there, keep typing those questions. We will not lose any of them. We have another break plan, and we will get to your questions then. Thanks. So when I looked for examples, and there were many examples of instances where social media could tell a story um, around a particular event, um, I gravitated to this one. I understand it's a K-12 example, and we may have K-12 representatives on this call, so I'm certainly comfortable using it, but I want for the purpose of the higher ed folks to recognize that um, the distance between this young, um, young, young gentleman and a college age student is tiny um, and, and the habits are still there. So 15-year-old um, first-year student, uh, a wrestler and a football player um, looked by all intents and purposes to be on the top of the game, so to speak, as both being likable and happy and friendly. Um, recently suspended, as the story goes, uh, from uh, the school and the football team because it got into a fight, right? Um, this could be if I was sitting with someone from student affairs, judicial affairs, student conduct, this could be any one of a uh, hundred students that come in and out the doors that are being addressed, whether at the K-12 level or the higher ed level. But this is what got posted on Twitter um, with this particular individual. And if we knew what was being shared on social media, would it may have made a difference? So this is Jalen talking about what was going to upset him, what's going to happen when it does, people aren't going to like what happens, um, you know, making statements about death uh, and violence. And if, because this is a conversation I've had many times, both as a police chief at a university and, and since then, you know, if there had been pictures of, of, of him posted with rifles and weapons, and for those of us who live in rural states like Vermont, during hunting season, photos of weapons on social media services um, aren't necessarily such a surprise as, as you know, people are heading out to go hunting and such. So on the particular day that this played out, as this story unfolded, Jalen sent text messages to friends and um, to two of his cousins. And the, the thing that sparked this was that Jalen's girlfriend had broken up with him and began dating his cousin. Okay, so uh, at 10.39 in the morning, he approached the table where they were sitting. Um, he got into a fight, a verbal fight with them, and then shot them with a Beretta handgun um, before he killed himself. This was October 24, 2014. Some of you may remember this at, at Pilchuck High. Um, and, and it really illustrated for us a, a real dire example of what's being shared on social media um, and, and what that means. And I could have, in addition, picked plenty of examples of social media at the university level that we found where there's been something involved with drug dealing, um, narcotics, um, uh, sexual violence. Um, the stories exist. Other examples. So I want to kind of bring this to a, to a, a, a point of summary and, and, and kind of get, get our hands wrapped around what does all this mean? So we talked about the prevalence of social media, the demographic, the more popular social media. We had some interesting questions on the dark web, that, that undercurrent of, you know, of, of, of activity. Um, some of the examples we're seeing around uh, uh, things happening through social media or happening that were found in social media. And the question that I often get asked from universities is, okay, so we know we got to do social media threat alerting. We know we got to pay attention to this, but how do we do it? It's the exact conversations that we had 15, 20 years ago with security cameras, with mass notification, right, with access control. And so I think it's important to look at the following when thinking about social media threat alerting. Understanding who's authorized to use the service or the system that your school is using to pay attention to social media threat alerts, right? Who has access to it? Um, what can they do with it? If you limit access to one or two people, you're, you might be handy, handicapped in terms of what you can do with it. If you expand it to too many people, you might have problems with, with ensuring the system is being used or the service is being used in a way that is um, as it's intended to be used. And recall that I said 64% of universities and colleges recognize the need to do this. 
two-thirds of those 64% are doing it manually. The other third is trying to figure out how to automate this, trying to figure out how to do it in a way that's cost-effective and smart technology to make it work. Understanding in terms of number two, the rules and permissions at the user level of the system. Understanding that, for example, you should have a system where the, you know, the counseling center can have its own login that allows it to look at suicide, depression-related um, filters and searches, um, while at the same time, perhaps residential life is looking at what's happening in the residence halls around safety and security and large gatherings, while the police department might be using it for large institutional events, um, and understanding that that each of them has its own permissions and its own safety and security within the system. Other people are not looking at their stuff, they're not looking at other stuff. That's important um, to have the right roles and permissions in a system that can do that. The third, understanding um, that the service should and shouldn't be used in certain ways and who can audit and, over and provide oversight on that. And I'll go back to the conversation with security cameras. I remember vividly instances in the beginning of the security camera um, world where um, different parts of the campus had different cameras and could access different systems. And the challenges we had when it wasn't either centralized or there weren't clear guidelines on who can use it and who can't use it and who has oversight. So I remember instances where video clips were being downloaded and taken from the athletic facility um, uh, by one particular individual who um, uh, liked looking at certain other individuals and thought taking the video clips of them working out was appropriate, right? Recognizing the challenges with how we control access. So knowing up front that if you have a threat alert service, who should use it, who shouldn't use it, and how do you audit that information? And how do you know? Um, and how do you deal with that? Fostering accountability is critically important in any kind of technology um, as powerful as the technology you might be looking at as you pay attention to the idea of threat alerts, right? The fourth, understanding that the keywords and the phrases and the topics you're using are approved, that you've developed the right expertise and you've gone with a system and a service that has the right expertise for this to be able to recognize, you know, what are the 35, 40, 80, 100, 400 particular comments, topics, behaviors, nouns related to safety and security, uh, related to suicide and depression, related to drugs, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia. You know, what are those terms? What are we using? What are we looking for? And then the last, making sure that the system that you use and the, and the way that you conduct your threat alerts flows into and is understood what you do with the information. It goes back to the question we had a little while ago, Steve. Um, we were asked, you know, what do you do with all of the stuff that gets posted, you know, by people who could have fake IDs and fake social media handles and so on and so forth. You still have to look at information. You still have to pay attention to it and at least do a cursory glance at the validity of that data, of that, of that threat, of the seriousness of that threat. And so having the right procedures to do that, and in many instances, universities and colleges across the country that are doing social media threat alerting are flowing the information that they receive into their existing procedures, their threat assessment teams, their police departments, their public safety, their residential life, flowing into their student of concern groups, flowing into the counseling centers, where processes already exist to be able to look at the information and assess it for its validity. Thanks, Gary. We've got a lot of time for questions. We do have a fair number of questions to get to, but I think we're going to have time for some more. So if you have some comments or questions for Gary, please type them in. Um, Gary, do you ever actively engage with those individuals who post concerning content on social media? Do you actively acknowledge that the message has been seen and use the response as an opportunity to share resources publicly? Absolutely. And I think it comes down to what's being posted. We've seen universities, examples where universities have done just that. Something is shared. It's of concern. It's around a particular incident or event, and the institution recognizes the opportunity to openly state through its own social media channels, you know, we, this, you know, this, op, you know, this service is available. This is here. We can do this here. Um, so absolutely. Um, and I think the decisions to do things like that flow from the processes that are made, or the decisions and 
and the assessments that are made by the experts on campus, the individuals in the threat assessment, multidisciplinary threat assessment teams at the institution that are looking at the particular post, the particular event, to understand what the best course of action is. Um, you've talked about roles and permissions, as well as searching for or certain keywords, are there some programs out there that are being used in order to search for these keywords? How are we able to search for all of the all of these sites? For how can you search all of these different social media sites for all of these specific keywords? So um, that's where the technology is evolving, and that's where the ability to 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 find services like Social Sentinel, for example, that has the ability to pull in and scan you know, a dozen or so social media services with keywords and expertise built for those libraries. So that's the, that's the trend. That's the next iteration of campus safety technology that I talk about, starting with security cameras, kind of going through access control, mass notification. This is the next. And I firmly believe, given, the, given how much our our students communicate through social media, how much our communities do, especially since universities and colleges, by example, are the most connected, internet-connected spaces we can be in, right? They, they are the hubs of the internet in many instances. That there is, the future is that in three to five years, I believe every university and college will be paying attention in some way, shape, or form using services that do social media threat alerting, services like Sentinel, because of the prevalence and the, and the sheer quantity of that information. There's several people who are interested in Yik Yak, and, and I'm going to read you a few of the questions, but, but let me throw in as, as an aside for those who don't know what Yik Yak is, perhaps you could, uh, you could be begin by an explanation of Yik Yak um, and, and its uh, speckled history. Um, so how does Yik Yak play a role here in the different social media applications listed? And someone says, with Yik Yak, Yak, I often monitor discussion threads that may suggest a student is contemplating suicide and actively engage in the discussion by offering resources available to help them. Because of its anonymity, the students believe other students are trying to help them. Oh, That's and I guess fantastic. one more. Will Social, will Social Sentinel ever monitor Yik Yak or Snapchat? Yeah, so let me start with the first. Um, uh, Yik Yak, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, is a social media service um, that um, and it's a smartphone application, so it works off your smartphone, um, iOS and Android. That creates allows people to create anonymous posts that are called yaks within about a five or so mile radius, and um, it's come under quite a bit of fire because of what people are saying on on Yik Yak about other people. And there have been you know plenty of examples of of cyber bullying and bullying and, and threats made. Um, using the service that has created a little bit of a firestorm um, as such. So I have to tell you, for, for the person who shared their, their solution to their engaging yaks um, uh, you know, and offering direct services back to those yaks, I, I applaud you. I actually think that's fantastic. Now, that's a lot of work because yik yak, you know, you're doing it manually as such. And related to the second question, um, as far as I know to date, and, and we've done quite a bit of research into this, um, Yik Yak and, and Snapchat um, continue not to provide access to their data feeds. Um, so uh, it's unlikely that uh, a company like Social Sentinel is going to be monitoring um, the feeds in terms of pulling them in to include them in our threat alert scans simply because those companies don't make that information public. And it raises the second question is that for the services that universities and colleges might be looking at, if those services include things like Yik Yak, you need to ask yourself, knowing what I just said, that they're not, they're not services that are, being, um, uh, that are allowing their feeds to be, to be um, incorporated into other services, that they're probably not getting that information in a way that's legal. So, you know, in terms of scraping the data off websites and so on and so forth. So, um, but it's an interesting challenge. Yik Yak has, has certainly caused a, a firestorm of conversation about, uh, you know, its usefulness. And it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. Um, how important is it to have an institutional account on all of these social media sites? Well, you know, that's a question I may not be as best qualified to, to, to respond to because I'm not a, you know, university communications officer, and I'm not someone who, you know, uh, services that do social media threat alerting are really looking at the digital cloud um, and looking at information and seeking things that are of concern, right, that, that generate a concern. Um, at, 
I, as opposed to you know what universities are doing to um, to share information through social media. I will tell you, I found it interesting. There was a a recent um, some of the recent work again that came out of um, the Pew Research Center and 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 Piper Jaffray and others that are doing research on social media shared that universities and colleges are increasingly using Facebook as an example and, and, and a couple of other um, of the larger social media services in admissions recruiting. And I'm wondering and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the research in the next you know, year or two, um, if 14% if, if of, of teenagers are using Facebook as it's trending downward, um, I guess the question is what's the best social media service for a university or college to be using for things like admissions and others. So um, I think the strategy question around what's the best social media service for a university to be using to communicate out to um, is, is one that I'd have to you know, punt to the communications people. Um, perhaps somewhat related to that, um, I, I wonder how do you coordinate who on campus does reply? Now that we've been talking, you've used a few examples um, about replying to posts that are out there. Um, you're going to presumably run into some faculty who feel that they ought to reply, or, or various other administrative offices. Um, uh, how do you coordinate the replies from uh, uh, campus officials to what students might be saying on any of these social media sites? Right. And I think the question for me is not so much what the trending of comments are. I think, again, that goes back to a communications office looking at trending sentiment and understanding what the issues are you know, writ large and how does that formulate into a communication strategy. As much as I'm looking at a particular student, an individual makes a post that is of concern. It either is indicative of uh, uh, you know, uh, self-harm, other harm, violence, criminal activity, and recognizing that the university, in many cases, in most all cases, has the right people in place to be able to manage that. So if it's a criminal-related act, your public safety, maybe your police department would deal with it. If it's a suicide, self-harm, depression-related post, you know, maybe it goes to your counseling center or to residential life or to student affairs, depending on who is best situated in the given circumstance. So I think you know, having multidisciplinary teams at universities that can work together to address the range of threats as universities have now is the best way to tackle that. Um, someone points out that Snap Trends just announced that they can get yaks using a certain formula. So it looks like you've got uh, measures and countermeasures going on even among the social media sites themselves. It's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to watch. There's, there's no question. You know, there's no question. Um, a while ago, uh, you, you referenced the dark web, uh, or perhaps it was in a question, uh, and somebody asked what the dark web is. So let me give you a chance to uh, tell folks who might not know what the dark web is. Yeah, to the extent that I'll, I'll, I'll go openly, um, you know, with my with my understandings of, of safety and security, but not necessarily of of what's called sometimes the deep 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 dark web. Um, it's the part of the World Wide Web content that exists on um, these dark nets, these these, these public internets that need special software and configurations and such to, to authorize them. A lot of, um, whether it's the dark internet or the deep dark web, there's a number of ways um, to call it, um, a lot of that space is used for criminal activity. And so it's the purview of, of companies and, and organizations that are paying attention to um, that kind of analytics. Analytics and, and law enforcement, federal and state, that are paying attention to what's going on there. So they're very hard to find um, websites and secretive networks. Um, they're accessible from your computers at your desk, but you got to know how to get there and, and what to do once you get there. Um, someone's uh, taking our attention back to that uh, that list, the the list of graphics of the various social media sites. And at the time, somebody asked what the one with the two dots was. Um, and uh, Tamara uh, uh, ne never found out what that one is. There we go. It's the one, two, three, or fifth one on the top row, I think. Flickr. Images. There you go. Yep, Flickr. And, and I should also, it, it really gives me an opportunity also, Steve, to point out many of these social services, social media services, are networked into each other. So let me go back to Yik Yak, or let me go back to Snapchat as an example in addition to these. Sometimes you'll see somebody will, will post something on Instagram, but it, re, it goes to the world through their Twitter account because they've linked Instagram 
Instagram to Twitter, or Facebook to you know to Google Plus, or whatever the linkings can be. They they do that. So you might get I've seen it happen where you might get something that is posted you know on a on an anonymous um, social media service, but that gets shared to the world you know publicly um, because the person receiving it put it up on their Twitter account, their Instagram account, their Pinterest account, so on and so forth. Now, well, also way back at the beginning, Gary, um, we, we, you, you talked about and there were some questions about the extent to which this is an invasion of privacy, and, and, and you pointed out uh, quite reasonably. Now, this, this is about monitoring threats. This isn't about invading anyone's privacy. Uh, we're, not, we're not monitoring everything that all the students on our campus are saying in order to, in order for, just for the purpose of monitoring. So, so I know that, and you know that, and all of the people who are on campus offices doing that know that. But, but how do you convince the students? students um, that when campus officials are doing exactly what they should be doing, that is looking for potential threats and suicide possibilities, that you are not monitoring that. How do you, how do you get that message out? Yeah, um, you know, what we found is that the generation of students coming into college that live on social media have a different perception of privacy um, and, and a different recognition of public information. And so what I mean by that is this idea that um, if, if it's being posted to a public social media source or service, that it's understood that the world can look at it, that it's out there for everyone to see. And so we're, you know, what we're seeing, and, and especially with, with social media threat alerting, is that it, it's, the re, it's the reaffirmation or, the, or the, um, the, um, the confirmation that schools aren't able to look at or shouldn't be looking at, in my opinion, private information. I, I don't... I, I mean, I, I don't think we should be doing that. It's private. If you didn't mean for it to be shared with the world, then I shouldn't be looking at it per se, right? And it's about looking at the the landscape, the digital cloud, for safety and security purposes, not because we want to see what the next board vote's going to, you know, going to you know trend. Not going to. So by by limiting social media threat alert services to safety and security, by recognizing that you're using it only to, to, to scan the digital cloud, the public available digital cloud, I think we're going to see the same thing we saw with security cameras, which is the same discussion we had. If you put a camera up, you can see me walking through the parking garage. You can see me walking down the street. And in the beginning, that was unnerving. I don't want you to look at me. I don't want you to see what's going on over there. But yet today, and it's interesting because in other parts of the world, in the UK, for example, the statistics on how often you're on a video camera are astonishing, and that's accepted. It's, it's the acceptance there. And so, so here, you know, years ago, the, 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 the trending, the, the evolution became an expectation. And then, of course, we put cameras in the pockets of all of our students, and literally in the palms of their hands. Um, and, and so um, I think with social media threat alerting, the issue of privacy is is ameliorated when we point out it's only public information that's being looked at, and in addition to only public information being you know looked at, we're not monitoring. You know the school isn't monitoring what's going on, and it's doing it for the purpose of safety and security. That's a great thought to end up on, Gary. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of our viewers and questioners from around the internet. Check the NCCPS webinars webpage for a link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as a link to our speaker's slides and information about future webinars. And watch your email for that brief evaluation survey on today's session. We read and act on your comments, and it will take you at most two minutes to fill it out. Please do. In addition to our Campus Public Safety online webinars, the National Center for Campus Public Safety lists a wide variety of other events and resources. You'll find details on the web at nccpsafety.org. Again, that's nccpsafety.org. And I want to call your attention to one particular upcoming event that many of you will want to attend from October 19th, 21st at the, uh, at the university, 19th and 21st. The University of Vermont will present its 25th annual Legal Issues in Higher Education Conference, which includes the campus public safety track produced in collaboration with the National Center. Speakers on the campus public safety track include some of the nation's leading experts in the field, covering such topics as fair and impartial policing, trauma-informed investigations, crafting a campus prevention program, and social media in campus public safety. Make a difference on your campus and take part in this annual conference at the University of Vermont Davis Center in beautiful Burlington, Vermont, where it is not snowing yet, or join online via the web 
via the live web streaming option. For details and to register, link to learn.uvm.edu slash legal issues. That's learn.uvm.edu slash legal issues. Campus Public Safety Online is brought to you by the National Center for Campus Public Safety with support from the University of Vermont Continuing and Distance Education and the U.S. Department of Justice. This. Special thanks today to Andrea Young and Dan Cardella. This is Steve Warona. See you next time on Campus Public Safety Online.